from me with a little bit of change of topic. Um, I'm going to talk about Web 2.0 in urban research. Um, uh, first, start, I'll explain to you what Web 2.0 is. Then I'll explain what you could do with it in principle. Then I'll give you an example from a research project I'm conducting um, what we do with Web 2.0 and that's about it now. We have an interesting discussion. When we speak about Web 2.0, it's some development stage. Um, so far we have Web 1.0, 2.0, and some on the speak of Web 3.0. Um, but the scientific community is not sure about this Web 3.0 thing, so I'm going to stick to this Web 2.0 um, name today. While Web 1.0 was mainly about information via the computer, Web 2.0 is um, the communication part via the internet and via the computer, so people start interacting um, in comparison to just simple websites where you can get your information, but in the Web 2.0 um, sites you can communicate, you can interact. And in contrast to what we heard this morning from uh, your presentation, um, Web 2.0 is about human-to-human -human interaction. It's not human-to-artifact interaction, which you presented. That's why um, many people also speak about the social web, this interaction with humans. And Web 3.0 is the new stage um, called or name the different stage because we have this um, geo-related um, information, meaning all the information you can find in the internet and the web can be related to some geographical location, which makes it even more interesting for urban um, research. Um, as in the early days of internet, many scholars spoke about the non-geographicality of the internet and the computer um, implementations, but today you can find many applications, especially using geotagging and other things, really locating information. You might know Google Maps and stuff, um, where you can really concentrate your personal information located somewhere on a map and bring it to the internet and someone else at the other end of the world can see like your personal video with and they will know when you shoot it. So I think that's the main interesting thing, especially for urban research. But what I want to look at further. So the whole Argumentation line of my presentation, you can see in bold letters on top that Web 2.0 offers opportunity in principle for um, research that's abbreviated. Sorry, you are as urban um, research and urban um, planning, as I'm an urban planner, more less concerned about implementations for urban um, planning, um, because they allow for more information for several target groups, several people and society, and you can use it in many areas of life. So if you look at Web 2.0 applications, you might make a classification of like four different kinds of uses for Web 2.0 applications that you can find. The first one would be providing information, which you also know from the web. Once you, it's just you open the internet and then find your information, whatever you're looking for. Hopefully, sometimes you won't find it, but you might find it somewhere. The second possible use of Vector Zero tools is to integrate others in whatever you do. So it could be other federal researchers, it could be some stakeholders, citizens, anyone somewhere in the world you would like to integrate 
either in your research, in your communication process, in your idea development, or whatever. The third use, possible use of Web2 CEO tools is to collect information from others, which you can use yourself for whatever you do. We're speaking about research especially, so it might be helpful for you to collect information from people somewhere around the world or even close by to you um, to integrate it into your research. And the fourth possible use of Web2 CEO tools would to be generate knowledge and even theory um, using especially those back to zero tools. So this will be four different kinds of users. I'll give you examples um, to make it clear, <coughs> naming some tools and stuff, because I don't know how familiar you are with all those web to zero applications that are out there. Um, the So, um, I don't know how much you already read about Web2C or if you even applied it somewhere in your daily life or in your professional life. Um, if you go to the future, there's a lot of argumentation why use Web2C or tools and why not use Web2C or tools, all have their good arguments. And so I'm going to present you. Um, some of them the most important, most often named reasons why to use or not to use web to zero tools. As internet has been developed pretty much, um, people argue that with the web to zero tools, the more social approach, the more easy availability of all this, it's more functional, it's more accessible even for people. You have um, implementations for people like who don't, do not hear or do not see. You can even use the internet. You have interactive um, possibilities. So those scholars argue that it would be much easier to use, um, to provide information, to generate information, to collect information while using the web to zero. Um, this can be embedded because there's a general shift to virtual interaction. I think most of you Probably all of you have done something on the internet, you're writing emails, you're probably a member of Facebook and whatever you do, you're shopping online and all this kind of stuff. Um, there's plenty of opportunities to do so. But another line of argumentation, as it's better available, the availab availability is much better um, with web to zero. Um, they also argue that other people can have a much more active role either in research or in daily life what you're doing so you have this feedback function you also know from several sites starting from like it buttons down to um, possibilities for large commentaries on the websites and blogs and stuff so there's a much better opportunity to give um, other individuals a bigger role, a more important role in that, what you're doing, because you really want to have this feedback as well. But then especially researchers argue that they don't really want that, because they're the experts. So there might be different kind of research at the end, if there's much more people start meddling into what you're doing. Um, so they might be a bit afraid of if there's like 100 normal people coming and commenting on what you're doing, um, maybe that's not what they want, actually. And then we also have this general problem. People are not familiar with the technologies. Um, they don't know the settings. They might not know the web pages, where to go to and all the applications and the tools. So you have many things to learn in order to apply the web to zero and also your audience or the people you want to talk to, they also need to know how to apply this and they also need a computer, internet connection, Wi-Fi or whatever. So what else? Thank you. Certainly many restrictions also to using web to zero and internet in all areas of life. 
but then you also have to be aware that all those many possibilities, at some point there might be too many. So what do you do with your capabilities, with your technology you have, your time that you're having? You spoke a bit about this as well in the morning. It can be really difficult to apply all those Web 2.0 applications. Um, in the time you're having, you need someone who knows what to do and how to do it, and then you certainly want to have a proper good outcome out of this. So there are also discussions. And um, maybe the most important point when it comes to urban research is how and to what extent did the perception of the urban, the global place and space and whatever belonging change while using the internet. During breakfast this morning, we discussed with Wolf our first, well, see, there you are. <laughs> our first experience when we started emailing back then. And he made emails to Brazil and then thought, yeah, maybe sometime I will get an answer. And he had this answer within two minutes. So the whole idea of global, uh, of, the, uh, of the world is big and stuff, and people are somewhere in remote areas. This changed within a second. I had similar experiences. And um, there's the question as well what does this make to our research concepts? Um, how do we research all those topics and what, how do our theories apply to all this? But I'll leave this to the discussion then later. Okay, now a short overview on Web to zero tools. I won't name them all, but if you want to know something about any of them, please don't hesitate to ask. Um, you might remember the four types I presented to you a short while ago. Um, so we have plenty of different tools and applications, especially when it comes to providing information. Um, starting from emails, we have blogs, wikis, Wikipedia is quite popular. Um, so you can see this, we have video platforms. <laughs> and video sharing tools, we have um, I'm sorry for naming some brands, but <laughs> you might um, know them better what I'm speaking about, like a slide share where you can upload your PowerPoint presentation and make it available for to long or even to a specific community and stuff. And very popular in urban research or urban planning are also GIS and virtual city models um, in order to um, present ideas, vision, future um, planning ideas to a wider audience. Mashups are just mixtures of anything you can think of. So this is like popular, probably the next big thing maybe, because lots of people talk about. Mashups and of course georeferenced data that can always locate your information and make it available in a different form to many people. When it comes to the second, um, collecting into information, I mentioned this, there's plenty of other possibilities to use via web to zero. Um, we have maybe I've, I've mentioned some social networks as well and tagging, which is labeling certain content with a short keyword so others can find it. That's what's hidden behind this word taxonomies, which is pretty new. So this is something people um, sort the internet according to their own principles or keywords. And if you're part of a community, maybe you can find stuff much easier on the internet and find out your own classification. Um, but you can also collect information from groups and even in research we've done some online focus groups. You might know the research method on focus groups, so you can do this online as well. So there's plenty of ideas and possibilities to integrate others and um, like asking them to provide information for you to use in the research. The third 
possible application is the integration of other people. This can be uh, federal searches, normal citizens, anyone, politicians, administrators, that's what we do at the moment in our research project. And you can also do this via forums, which is not done that much often. You can do it via wikis, collective setting up of information and using it. And with collaborative tools, I don't know if you know Google Docs or other shared documents where you can upload and somewhere else in the world someone, if he or she has the password, can also download the uh, documents, work on it, even maybe online. And so you can um, change your search process. And you can even integrate others into your research process in, in file, um, setting up blogs, having comments from other people um, you wouldn't reach normally, or just having online panels, we have web surveys and stuff. Um, many other possibilities also to integrate people. And when it comes to the last one, generating knowledge and theory, you might be interested in most. Um, there's only a few web to zero tools to do so <laughs> because this hasn't been developed yet that much. But still there are some because I'm going to give you an example later on during this talk. Um, you can always use conventional methods that's been developed without the computer or the internet and apply it to the internet. Sometimes it works out, sometimes it doesn't. So you need some experience and reflection on this as well. But you also have sorry, completely new methods. Um, for example, with um, software that's especially being developed for internet data analysis, which I'm going to speak of in about a minute. So that's not, I'm sure there's plenty more web to zero tools and applications. I just If you go to the literature, um, some researchers looking at internet users, the implications of web 2.0 on research, they state that research is that itself has changed. Um, first, starting with what are they looking at? So, in the first years when web 2.0 emerged, Many people just started to, to look at the technology, what does it do to people, how do they use it and stuff. And by now, um, for several years, the researchers start to look at the further possibilities this technology offers and the social approach of Web2.0 offers for their research design. And then, especially with the geo reference data you can find anywhere on the web, you can people ask to do georeferencing um, within your research design and we have a different quality of data you get out of this um, so you can play with this aspect as well. There's been some research projects done on this already. Um, like having um, subjective maps, people creating their own maps like closely connected to mind mapping and if you know this and then work on with this kind of information coming up, maybe with something completely different. So there are already some researchers who use the vector zero tools, but not that many, because um, for the reasons mentioned, it's difficult with the difficulties with the technology and stuff, and then we don't have the time to learn it and many other things. But I think it's growing, so there's plenty of online journals dealing with this, um, special editions, and whole books being published on this matter. Oh, sorry. So when we look at the literature, we mostly find single case studies on applying one tool to one situation. Um, we don't find many systematization like what is it like to use Twitter in urban research or something, so that's, um, that's still lacking, I have to say. Um, then there's some case studies of applying certain methods to 
your research design and it's also mostly single case studies, so you have to it's it's not easy to to, to deduct what if you read it, what can you use for your own research, so it's really difficult to transfer in some cases because it's often it's also from very different areas like marketing research and stuff um, so it's, you have to go the whole way and um, think what can these marketing people tell me for my, integ my integration my back to zero tools into urban research so that's not that easy but we also have a development that's completely disciplines to be found to completely rely on the internet and online and web to zero tools. Uh, most prominent is maybe virtual ethnography. It's around for like 12 or 13 years. There's been plenty of literature published on this. Um, so this is a whole new field, I think, and internet planning, e-planning is also a new discipline coming up. There might be some future to this. So this was just a short overview on where we stand at the moment. Um, I'll give you now a short example from a research project I'm conducting for already two years. We have one more year. It's, oh, there's a D missing. It's called City of Solidarity. <laughs> it's dealing with the possibilities of cooperatives to improve sustainable lives in cities. It's only German cities and it's different kinds of cooperatives, housing cooperatives, energy cooperatives, mobility cooperatives, food cooperatives and neighborhood cooperatives included in the research project. And as we do some very practical research, um, we really want to communicate to others, to widen our audiences, but we also have to communicate with our fund giver, the um, German Ministry for Research, and lots of other people. So we set up a blog. Um, you can find your address there. It's in German, unfortunately, so for those of you who speak German, you're welcome to read the blog. We also use shared documents. Um, this one is called Mixed. It's another platform you can upload your documents. That's where we store our final versions of recitations, of texts. So if, if we just have uh, text to revise, we send them via email. So we try to separate um, work processes from each other because we're not located in the same city. We're not located at the same institute. So we have to get organized somehow. We also use um, another collective research tool. It's called Zotero. It helps to organize your literature. You can do it online. So whoever finds some interesting book on the internet, you can just click and it downloads all the information and <laughs> saves it. And with another click later on, you can make your, your, your bibliographic list and just make it available to everyone in the project. If you have a password, you have your own file, where all the documents are shared. You can have a pool text, but you can only have bibliographical data. There's many other similar um, platforms around. This one doesn't cost any money, so that's why I use it. Um, we also offered a seminar on Web to Zero using research and practice. That's been last year. And what I'm going to talk about is the collective data analysis. We did or it's still doing at the moment until the end of April um, in our research project. So we went to seven cooperatives in Germany and asked people, members of the cooperative, ended up with 36 interviews and now started to analyze our data and as we are an interdisciplinary research project we come from six different disciplines 
we work at six different institutions in three different cities in Germany. So that's why we didn't always have the time to get together and discuss things. That's why we decided to do it online. This is just to explain a bit more um, who we are and what we're doing. So you can see in the out, outside the circle, you can see the six different disciplines taking part in the project. And each discipline has one researcher, except the urban planning, that's we are two. And each discipline in the analysis of data has one keyword they have to analyze. So it's the urban planners. For exception, we have two keywords. That's because we are not more people, so we have to do two. It's solidarity and the urban. Political science is responsible for analyzing lifestyles and so on. Uh, please bear this in mind when I go to my next slide, or maybe the, the one after. Okay, at this first glance, what it looks like. It's, the software is called Atlas TE. So you have to introduce this one, so it's all in German. I just wanted to. Um, get your attention for this one. You can mark quotations with codes, and then it looks like you have a book with something written on the edges of the book, like making your remarks. But the difference is, it comes in different colors. So this is according to the keywords you're having, and if you click on the keywords, you can also see who put that on, that, on this place. So you can always arrange and sort all the interviews and data according to several things, the days you coded it, the people who did it, the keywords, of course, and many other things. So you have different layers of information you can sort and arrange, and you can even get out maps of how uh, several keywords are related to each other. Because we're not finished, I cannot show you, because you can only do this in the end. But, so there's plenty of possibilities to play around. Okay, um, this is, I don't want to get too much into how this works technologically, but my most, speaking about the city between experience and theory, my most important experience doing all this was because I'm responsible for the um, urban part, so I have to write a text in the end about all the aspects dealing with urbanity, the city, that come out of the interviews. So when we started coding the interviews, like putting the keywords into the text, for time reasons we did this, each had to do five whole interviews. So at that time, the The keywords, the responsibilities didn't matter. So we just coded the whole interviews. This meant that someone from diversity studies also coded the urban parts and the city parts. And when this was done, I had to deal with this. And I had to ask myself, why did this person code this? What is the relation to the city? So I had to go and ask this person, and then we started discussing why someone from diversity studies or participation studies thinks this has to do with city. And this is really interesting, I'll tell you. <laughs> because from my perspective, being a planner, I was focused on administrative things. But none of the others ever coded anything that was related with administration. So I really have to start reflecting on what is their idea of city and why did they code this. And so we're in this process now. Next week we have our first personal, real meeting in person um, to discuss this, and I'm really looking forward to do so and the outcomes as well, because we really want to have an interdisciplinary outcome of our research. And I think we're on a good way to do so. But yeah, then maybe in half a year on our website you can find the results. Okay, I told you. This is what we did, and after having written those texts, there's always the possibility to 
geo, uh, geo tag, the quotation, so we can draw maps with this is a privacy or security issue. If the interviewees are willing, we can code and draw maps of someone in Berlin said this and someone else in Munich said something else and stuff, but we haven't thought about this because we have to wait what comes out of the interviews, but there's still more possibilities. Okay, to conclude, um, we're doing qualitative research, but we can also apply web to zero to quantitative research, which is being done much more, I guess. Um, it's my experience. Um, it's if you apply it in specific ways, it can be really challenging to the notions and perception of city and urban space. In my case, it's, I'm sure it's been the same for the other disciplines in the project as well. Um, but all those things are not reflected much in theory yet, in early theory, so there's a vast field for further research projects if you're looking for topics. Um, and it really had to facilitate or it had to, to sustain interdisciplinary communication between us because we always, when we open the website, we can always see what someone else has done. So any any time we can even then send an email or write our comments right in the document asking people what did you mean with this and all this stuff. So there's a lot of interaction going on. It's time consuming for sure, but less time consuming than you have to go to a different city and meet and talk and discuss things. Um, and as I told you, I'm at the moment, I don't know what it's going to be like in a few months' time when we finish, but I think it can be really facilitate interdisciplinary results because you don't have to go all the distance, like topic-wise and geographically, to in order to discuss things or come to a conference. You can do it online. Um, I'm not saying that it's always the best solution, but in this case, it's been a really good solution for our course. That's it. Thank you very much, everyone, especially the translator. I think she only hears it. You won't see it on the slide. And everyone who organized this conference and thank you. what I know what's been done in Berlin. Um, I don't know if you know about those video battles on YouTube. Someone loads up a video and others make other videos to answer this and like furthering the topic. So there's been a street working project in Berlin doing this. So we couldn't see on the internet what's going on. Um, I didn't mention this, um, but it's good that you're asking because with um, applications on smartphones, 
you can have plenty of users. Uh, what's becoming quite, quite popular is having um, theater via mobile apps. So you walk through the cities, you have guided tours, someone made a play or guided tour and you just walk the way you want to walk through the city and whenever you come to a hotspot it automatically starts to tell you something or music starts and stuff and you can even make contact with others because you see them on the display. Um, things like that are possible, um, but you're also right, it might be difficult because the users are limited, especially people who have no access to smartphones, they expensive, uh, internet can be expensive for many people. Um, so that's actually one of the questions I would like to ask of you, <laughs> because I don't, I, I'm speaking mainly from situation in, in Germany and uh, maybe Western Europe, so I don't know what it's like over here, or recently I've been to Brazil, so no one will do that because they don't have the possibility to, to join in. Um, that's uh, certainly a limitation. I'm aware of this, so I, that's why I'm not saying that's the future, but there are good reasons to use it sometimes. I have just a very brief question. Among other tools, you mentioned role-playing simulations. Mm -hmm. Could you elaborate on that a bit? Because like, I'm familiar with all the rest, but that as an online tool is something unusual. Yeah, okay. Um, I don't know if any of you have been to Second Life already. Um, role-playing simulations might be similar to um, this, but they originally come from social work psychology. You have those uh, start taking on a role and act in that role. And then you can do it on the internet by using avatars and stuff. So you just become someone and interact in a way. And then you can also, like, if you're a researcher, you can tell someone now you're the very old senior citizen and you have to act like this guy in the role playing and someone else is the young girl and whatever and then you have to interact virtually and stay in that role as well and you, you cannot surely play with that role um, so it started to be like more from a therapeutic position but it's becoming more and more even for um, research or even interaction you can use it or you have some avatars some roles that guide you to the city and stuff so that's not been explored enough yet perhaps i ask a question um, uh, from a different angle you know uh, thank you for the presentation i think it's very important for contemporary future researchers. But besides this new ways of dealing with tools and communication, do you think uh, that the changes, the fundamental change of research could um, be connected with the very way of presentation of the uh, paper or research, you know, the academic discourse, the academic narrative itself? You know, we have a very strong tradition of the written culture, how to, to write, I would say, a scholarly paper, you know, the way of arguments uh, going on and so So with these new technologies, uh, do you think that the very way of presenting the material should change? You know, because it's impossible, you know, we can simply, you know, uh, send our papers to each other in a way, but if we work within this virtual world, Probably there is a new idea of uh, this scholarly, uh, I don't know, probably discourse, uh, or the logic of presenting this work. But I think it's very important, and especially with globalizing of, of academic studies, we have some practical things how to present it when you present it in Russian and English, these are different texts in a way. Uh, so uh, somehow it creates this, many other, you know, there are some ramifications of problems that appear with new technologies. What do you think about it? Yeah, I hope so, because <laughs> I have my problem with the existing academic system. Um, but then there are also some problems with it. Um, 
like I done a very conservative presentation. There were no pictures and stuff, and I thought it might be a good contrast. I could also, well, actually my first idea was to have a really colorful presentation showing you all the brands and stuff and applications and walking through the internet with you. It's really exhausting um, for both you and me to do so. It's time consuming to set it up. Um, I would really like to try something into that direction in the future. I haven't had the time yet, so there's much more to do. Um, there's two, like, I don't know if you know Prezi. It's, there's, oh, they have different presentation tools on the internet. Most of them cost money, unfortunately, which allow you to present, present your, your stuff in a very different way and to have them related in completely different ways. And another thing is the open source movement. Um, there are some radicals who ask for openly peer-reviewed research texts, so that would be really interesting to have a scholarly text put it on the internet and it's only being published in a book if like 100,000 people all over the world think it's good enough to be published. So there's, there's people who are propagating this I think it's pretty radical, but especially with this open source movement and people dealing with Web 2.0 and Web 3.0, um, there's going to be lots of changes in the future, and I hope it's, there might be some different criteria applied to academic work as well. If it's always good, I can't tell at the moment, but I see some good opportunities. Can I ask you an existential question? Please. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, you, a while ago, you were attacked by police defending community interest. Remember the episode uh, <laughs> in the time? So I just wanted to ask you, what, what kind of, what, inspi what inspires you? What, what keeps you going? Uh, could you bring us, could you give us uh, uh, very briefly uh, a case of uh, success? I mean, when it comes to community life, when it comes to organizing community, is there something we can mention briefly that could make or add inspiring example? <laughs> um, that's a very difficult question. So if, if I relate it to my scientific work, <laughs> So I, I really try to, to communicate and make people, especially the students, understand and discussing stuff and finding different ways to communicate. I mean, I have a personal agenda um, as well, which Elena keeps calling me a political activist. I think I'm not, but um, rather like having a special attitude towards community life in the cities, especially Berlin, where I'm based. And, doing lots of local politics as well, which also involves um, people getting together, finding new ways of communicating. So I'm still supporting actively uh, raising funding money for theatrical plays in the streets and stuff. So it all, always deals with mixing media and, and targeting different audiences. And yeah, maybe work against the hierarchy system in academia. That's another agenda. <laughs>